So this is our campus. And uh, as you see, I start uh, from the beginning of the beginning because this is a drawing of Leonardo. Leonardo da Vinci, it seems he is a, I use it as a general introduction uh, because as you might know, Leonardo was going uh, night time uh, to do autopsy, let's call it like that, uh, to the dead people just to understand how the anatomy was. And so he already started to understand how all our vascular system is organized. But this idea of how the vascular system develops and the characteristic of the vessels uh, was very romantic because he thought that the heart was a seed and from the seed like a tree all the uh, uh, branches would develop and uh, uh, all the vessels uh, would be go get organized and indeed we now know that things are much more complex than this. So I try to summarize in this slide uh, in a very very schematic way the different step of uh, uh, endothelial cell differentiation and vascular development. And I just put some of the papers uh, that we have done uh, related to this uh, part of the work. And uh, of course, there are very many other groups that uh, contributed much more than we did, but just to give you some ideas. So let's say that you can uh, distinguish different steps in endothelial differentiation that go from uh, progenitors that are called uh, in general angioblast. Uh, which differentiate uh, at very early stages of embryonic development, which is around seven and a half days of development in the mouse. And uh, these cells are able to undergo a sort of uh, first uh, step of differentiation and to get organized in what is called the primitive vascular plexus. So you should also consider that in this uh, uh, stage of development, uh, the heart is not beating yet. And endothelial cells have a sort of uh, innate uh, program uh, to undergo tubulogenesis, to, to create uh, tubes uh, and to organize in this sort of uh, plexus, which, however, is very fragile. So uh, there are other processes that should uh, uh, take place uh, in order for the vascular to, to resist uh, to the sheer stress uh, created by the heart when it starts to beat. And so this is uh, in general called vascular remodeling, which includes uh, the differentiation of the vessels into artery, vein, and also later on in lymphatics, uh, and also the capacity of endothelial cells that are exposed to the sheer stress uh, to produce substances that induce the recruitment of pericyte. And the pericyte, uh, in turn, uh, would stabilize the vasculature by producing uh, substances like angiopoietin that are able to uh, uh, increase the resistance of endothelial cell to apoptosis and to overall uh, stabilize the vasculature and to resist to the blood flow. But on the other side, uh, more and more, uh, uh, is, uh, you know, there is more and more interest in understanding a further step of differentiation, which is the organ-specific differentiation of the vasculature. And uh, in other words, the vessels, once they penetrate into the different tissues in the different organs, they acquire specific uh, uh, properties. So as we will see, for instance, uh, the brain microvasculature needs uh, to control very tightly permeability because the central nervous system is particularly sensitive to toxic uh, substance presence in the, uh, in the blood or to inflammatory cells. On the other side, if you go to postcapillary venules or to the bone marrow or to the gland vasculature, in that case, permeability is very poorly controlled because you do need a very dynamic interchanges between blood and tissues and so on. The major problem here is to isolate the endothelial cells from, this, uh, uh, from the vasculature of the different organs and to maintain their specialized properties because, uh, let's say, the specialization of the vessels is strictly mediated by the crosstalk with the surrounding cells. So usually you need to develop good culture, but we are still at the beginning of this, uh, uh, of this, uh, this um, aspect of uh, vascular biology. So, on the other side, of course, uh, there are uh, transcriptional factors which are crucial to induce uh, the different step of vascular differentiation. And as you can see here, there is a long list that mediates uh, the differentiation of the angioblast to the primitive vascular plexus. And these are considered a sort of a group of transcriptional factors that induce pan-endothelial type of characteristics. And uh, on the other side, there are other transcriptional factors, in particular 
the transcription of fatal downstream or not for arterial differentiation of QTF2, which seems to be specific for venous differentiation, and other transcriptional factors, which include uh, SOX18 or PROX1, which are crucial for lymphatic differentiation. So there is a lot of research now going on in trying to define these transcriptional factors uh, with the hope to be able then uh, to modulate uh, the vascular differentiation. And of course, uh, still relatively unknown, uh, is the, uh, uh, let's say, the topic of the possibility to identify transcriptional factors that are important for the organ-specific vascular differentiation that I mentioned before. So taking all of this into account and also underlining, I would like to underline the extreme diversity of the vessel in the different uh, organs, not only comparing arteries and veins and lymphatics. We have been focusing uh, during the last years uh, in particular on a particular structures of the endothelial cell that are cell to cell junction. And we look to how these junctions are organized, whether they can be modulated by transcriptional system, and how they can influence uh, the uh, pathological reaction of the vasculature. So why are we interested in endothelial cell to cell junctional structures? Because they are very important, at least we believe, because they are important not only for the control of permeability to cell and solute, and for cell I mean inflammatory cells like leukocyte or dendritic cell and so on, but uh, what is uh, more and more clear is that this structure also transfer uh, intracellular signal. And these signals are important for inducing contact inhibition of cell growth, which is particularly relevant in the endothelial cells because, as you know, they grow in monolayer and they are contact inhibited as soon as they establish uh, junction and cell-to-cell uh, -cell contact. And uh, as a consequence, uh, these structures are important to establish uh, the polarity of the endothelial cell, which is uh, in turn uh, crucial for, lumen, uh, for a correct lumen organization. They induce a stabilization signal in a general sense, which means that they are able to inhibit cell apoptosis, to increase the resistance to apoptosis, and to inhibit cell motility. So taking all of this into account, uh, we, let me show you how the junctions are organized and what we know so far. And again, I mean, this uh, is a sort of uh, simplified uh, cartoon, uh, but just to give you some uh, ideas of the molecules that are implicated in the organization of endothelial junction. As you can see here, you can distinguish at least two types of junction. One, uh, uh, one type is called tie junction, and the other is adherent junction. And these are very similar, at least in structure, to what uh, has been uh, described uh, in epithelial cells. So as you can see here, and I just uh, mentioned the most important aspect, the tie junction, in the tie junction adhesion is promoted by members of the so-called clouding family, which are tetraspanning transmembrane protein, uh, which mediate a very tight adhesion between two adhesant cells. There are also small immunoglobulin, which include uh, gem, is, and nectin, that also contribute to the tight adhesion that is uh, uh, mediated by the tal junction. And then uh, uh, if you move to adherent junction, in this case, as you can see, the molecular components are totally different from tie junction. In this case, uh, adhesion is promoted by cadirins, which are uh, also transmembrane protein, which mediate homotypic type of adhesion and uh, are linked inside the cells to specific partners, which include beta-catenin, placoglobin, P120, which are from one side mediate the anchorage to actin, and on the other side also are important for, uh, uh, for um, cell signaling. And in particular, all the three, P120, placoglobin, beta-catenin, when are not recruited at the membrane, are able to translocate to the nucleus and modulate cell transcription. And on the other side, as you can see here, in this uh, relatively long list, there are also other signaling proteins, which include uh, kinase like SARC or phosphatase or growth factor receptor that can uh, be recruited uh, at the adherent junction and modulate uh, the capacity of the cells to respond to different stimuli. So taking all of this into account, one of the questions uh, related to my first introduction was, uh, so would the junction change along the vascular tree? And if we consider that they are important for cell signaling, but also for the modulation of permeability, <laughs> we would expect that they should be different if you consider, again, postcapillary venul, or if you consider lymphatics. And lymphatics are, as you might know, and is represented here, 
uh, is a particular vascular system uh, where there is a very dynamic interchanges uh, between the lymphocyte, the dendritic cells, and the lymph. So we started a work in collaboration with a group in San Francisco of Donald McDonald to first of all to see whether we could visualize the junctional organization in vivo and whether we could see any difference comparing the different type of vasculature. And as you can see here, uh, if you use antibodies directed to the different uh, junctional protein, you see that in most cases, arteries, veins, large or small vessels, uh, you distinguish a sort of zipper-like type of uh, structures uh, that follow all the periphery of the cells when they are in contact. This, uh, in particular, is bicadirin, that is uh, an endothelia-specific uh, cadirin present only in endothelia cells uh, and is the major component of the adherent junction in this cell type. And as you can see, when you stay in the vasculature, you see this sort of zipper-like type of structure that uh, is all along uh, the periphery of the endothelial cells. But on the other side, when we look uh, to the lymphatic, uh, and in particular to the terminal lymphatic that you can see here with this enlarged uh, lumen, uh, in this case, the staining was totally different. And uh, as you can see here in red, uh, for instance, uh, the vicadirin seems uh, to have a sort of dotted uh, type of distribution. This is another image showing how in this uh, terminal lymphatic that you can see here, uh, the organization of the junction seem, seems to be different. Terminal lymphatic means that uh, all the interchanges with lymphocyte and so on, of course, and lymph, of course, in these stages, in this uh, uh, area of the lymphatic system, well, then the lymph and the cell are, uh, uh, then uh, goes into the collecting lymphatic that bring uh, uh, the cells and the lymph to the lymph node. So then uh, we went a little bit more into this, and just to give you some ideas of this work, uh, what we found uh, is that uh, the terminal lymphatics so where the dynamic interchanges occur, there is this uh, dotted type of distribution of the vicadirin, but all the junctional protein have uh, the same type of distribution. Well, when you go to the collecting lymphatic that uh, collect the lymph cells, in this case, uh, as you can see here, you see the zipper-like uh, type of structures. If you go to this reconstruction, you can see that in red is where vicadirin, as I said, but also all the other tight junction proteins, they are all expressed in lymphatics, but again, they are only localized in specific region of the membrane. This is one endothelial cell in contact with another. And in green, you see is another membrane-specific membrane markers that is leave present in between this sort of hot spot of adhesion. And then uh, Donald uh, McDonald performed a scanning electron microscopy. And as you can see here, this is the appearance of this junction, which is really unique. And uh, you can call them like oak leaf type of uh, structures that form uh, this flap, uh, which is intermingled with another one. And the adhesive protein are concentrated at the periphery of the flap. So the idea that we develop is that the flap are important as a sort of valve that allow the passage of the cells or the lymph, but then inhibit the exit of cells and lymph. And uh, the adhesive protein are necessary because otherwise uh, you would get, uh, you know, a sort of very unstable contact between the cells. And so they keep the adhesion between the cells in between the flap. And if you see here, maybe this is clear, uh, uh, we were also able by electron microscopy to see the passage of the lymphocyte uh, and you can appreciate the presence of the flap through which the cells go through. So to make the long story easy, <laughs> we thought that uh, uh, this is the easiest way. So in the majority of the vasculature, you get a zipper-like type of junction all along uh, you know, the contact between the endothelial cells. In the lymphatic, instead, uh, you get a sort of uh, button type of, uh, of structures. Unfortunately, this guy is very fat, and so you cannot see the flap. But uh, you know, if you get uh, something more, you, know, you get something like that. So the cell pass, but then it would be difficult to exit again. Unfortunately, all of this is difficult to study in vitro, because again, uh, as soon as you isolate the lymphatic cells, uh, uh, from the tissues that in culture they go back to the collecting type of phenotype, so they form a zipper type uh, like a structure. So this is one uh, uh, very specialized type of vasculature, 
But uh, on the other side, uh, what happened uh, in the brain? And as I mentioned before, the brain microvasculature now is uh, uh, getting more and more popular because we know very little uh, at the molecular biology level of how these highly specialized vasculature develop. And uh, as I mentioned before, this vasculature is highly specialized because the brain has very, uh, uh, very specific needs. <laughs> And uh, in particular, as you see here, the junctions are highly developed. Uh, there is a very uh, uh, high, uh, well-developed high junction system that form uh, all series of network uh, that keep the endothelial cell together, together with the adherent junction. But of course, you do need some permeability to nutrient, because if you limit the junction so well organized, of course, limit permeability very tightly. But you do need to have transporter system in order for the nervous cells to receive the necessary nutrient. And so the brain microvasculature is characterized by the presence of glucose transporters, in particular GLUT1 transporter, amino acid, and others, to guarantee the survival and the, uh, 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 and, uh, you know, the nutrients for the nervous system. So these cells, uh, why are so well uh, uh, developed and specialized? And this is likely mediated by a strict crosstalk with surrounding cells. And in particular, as you might appreciate from this slide, there are the pericytes that are in tight, tight contact with these cells. And it's fantastic when you see the morphology of the vasculature or when they followed the different step of the brain vascularization, because you can see that the first are the, the vessel that enter during embryonic development and then there are the pericytes that walk along the vasculature and then embrace the vessels and in this way stabilize and possibly release a specific substance that induces the size specialized characteristic of these cells. And also the astrocyte, as you can see here, play a crucial role. So, so far it was of interest to separate the cells, and this is feasible, but uh, you do need a co-culture with the astrocyte to maintain some of the blood-brain barrier characteristic. Why they are so interesting? Because you should imagine, for instance, that from a translational point of view, only less than 5% of the chemicals, so small molecular weight chemicals, can cross the barrier. So there are a series of pathologies which include Alzheimer or depression or... Uh, uh, others uh, that uh, cannot be cured uh, because of the lack of passage of chemicals through the barrier. So the possibility to modulate uh, this uh, tight, uh, tight control permeability has a lot of implication on one side. On the other side, however, the uh, destabilization of the barrier, so the lack of the control of permeability, would lead to edema. And this is one of the phenomena typical of the ischemic stroke, uh, that uh, uh, you know, induce, as you know, the, for ischemic stroke, there is essentially no effective therapy. And the presence of the edema extends damage. But, and also, of course, uh, the hemorrhagic stroke. So there are different pathologies, including the tumor glioblastoma, where edema induces, again, compression. And so there is a lot of interest on in understanding the molecular biology, the possibility to manipulate the blood-brain barrier because of uh, several translational problems to be solved. So one of the questions that we asked was which are, as I mentioned before, the transcriptional factors which regulate the specialized characteristic of endothelial cell-to-cell -cell junction in the brain. And to make, again, the long story short, uh, we have been focusing during the last uh, couple of years, uh, probably more, three years, on a particular system that is the WIND system. WIND system, WIND, uh, you may probably know, uh, is an important family of growth and differentiation factors. They act through different uh, signaling pathways. And in particular, we have been uh, focusing on what is called the canonical WIND signaling, which is as a major mediator of signal beta catenin. And I already mentioned this protein because it is bound to cadherin at the level of adherent junction, but is also very important for as a signaling proteins downstream of wind. So what it was striking to us was that while the wind system has been studied very extensively in the differentiation, embryonic development of different organ and tissue, very little is still known on the development of the vascular system. 
And uh, uh, despite all of this, uh, there, there were indirect evidence that uh, the knockout uh, of uh, different uh, uh, wind component could indeed alter the development of the vessels. And also uh, in the tumor vasculature, uh, wind can play an important role in the overall morphology of the vessels because the tumor cells can produce high amount of these uh, uh, growth and differentiation factors. So how uh, uh, is uh, wind are working and in particular how the canonical uh, uh, wind signaling pathway is working. So as you can see here very schematically, <coughs> On the left, uh, if the cells are not exposed to wind, uh, the receptor complex uh, is not uh, linked to the ligand, uh, to the wind, uh, and uh, 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 at the cytoplasmic uh, level, uh, beta-catenin, that as I said is uh, uh, one of the major signaling protein for the canonical signaling, uh, is uh, quickly phosphorylated and degraded in proteasome by the effect of what is called the degradation complex formed by axin, APC, which is the adenomatous polyposic scoli, and then uh, casein kinase or GSK3 beta. So the this destruction complex is effective. However, when wind is added to the cells, when the cells are in contact with wind, then wind binds to the receptor complex, in particular to a freezer receptor. There are very many freezers, but uh, they all share the same structure. They uh, span the membrane seven times. And then together with LRP, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this linkage of the ligand to the receptor complex induces a dismantling of the in activation complex for beta-catenin, and beta-catenin is stabilizing the cytosol, can translocate to the nucleus, and induce a series of uh, wind target gene. So what we did, uh, uh, we used a mouse, uh, which is a reporter mouse uh, developed by uh, uh, Stefano Piccolo in Padova. And uh, this mouse uh, is of interest because uh, it has a seven consensus repeat <laughs> for beta catenin, which act uh, together with the TCF as a transcriptional factors, and then uh, uh, is uh, uh, modulating the expression of LAG-Z. So it's a simple, relatively simple model, but to our uh, view is probably the most sensitive model to follow, for instance, during embryonic development where uh, wind is active, canonical wind signaling is active. And so we used the model to see whether there was any wind signaling during vascular development. And uh, so this is the, um, the reported mouse. And we also used uh, two different models. One is the loss of function model for beta catenin that uh, in this case uh, the mice uh, uh, contain two log sequence in the beta catenin uh, gene. And so uh, when the cells are uh, express CRI, there is a recombination of the protein and you get uh, a null mutation of beta catenin. So you uh, uh, block uh, the canonic signaling of wind. And on the other side, we also use another mutant that is a gain of function mutation of beta catenin, where the exon 3 of uh, beta catenin is again uh, flanked by two LOX uh, sequence. And in this case, uh, CRI activity would uh, uh, delete the exon 3, and uh, uh, there is uh, the formation of a stabilized beta catenin because exon 3 code for the sequence that is phosphorylated and is responsible for the degradation of the protein. So in the case of the gain of function, it's like if the cells are continuously activated by wind because beta catenin is stabilized. So what happened? And so this was the work of Stefan Liebner in uh, uh, our lab. And what, uh, looking to the different uh, vessels and uh, where wind could uh, be active during development, he was uh, particularly impressed by the very high expression of the wind signal in the brain microvasculature. In green, here are the microvessels. In the brain, uh, two different steps of development, which correspond to development of brain vascularization and blood-brain barrier differentiation. And of course, you see a lot of cells which are red, so express uh, uh, like Z. Uh, and this because during the development of the nervous system, there are, of course, the nervous cells which are uh, activated by wind. But on the other side, you can appreciate how the green uh, vessels also have uh, red uh, nuclei. So there is a wind uh, activation during uh, vascularization of the brain. And it was uh, quite striking because uh, when uh, Stefan started to make a quantification of this uh, 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 activation of the microvasculature, what he observed <laughs> is that it starts as soon as the uh, brain is vascularized. Then there is a drop. I would like to underline that uh, uh, 
this is uh, just before the birth of the embryo. And uh, in this case, however, the nuclei can be still quantified. And then uh, little by little, in correspondence to the development of the blood-brain barrier, there is a decline of the wind signaling. So it is like if you do need uh, wind signaling during vascularization, development of the blood-brain barrier, once the blood-brain barrier is established, then uh, uh, the wind system doesn't work anymore. So we decided to go a little bit more into that, uh, and we selected some readout uh, for the development of the blood-brain barrier. In particular, we selected Claudine 3, and you might remember from my previous slide uh, that Claudine is a member of the Thai junction, and apparently is specific for the brain microvasculature. So this was uh, quite an interesting marker. Of course, we use leakage of blue events, like a sort of gener generic markers of permeability. And then we use the expression of this protein that is called MECA32 or PLVAP, which is interesting because this protein is expressed when the permeability is very low. So it goes on the opposite side than Claudine 3. Claudine 3, let's say, is a marker of the presence of tie junction. MECA32 is like if, you know, is a marker of the break of the junction. In other words, where uh, when uh, the permeability is increased in the brain and also in other organs. So still, uh, the, the function of this protein is, I must say, is still uh, relatively obscure, but still was a good <coughs> marker to, to, to use at uh, the readout of the blood-brain barrier. And of course, in vitro, we also looked to the uh, freeze edging, uh, uh, pre uh, true freeze edging of the presence of the typical tie junction structure that form this sort of network uh, in between one cell and the other. So what we did was then uh, to use a loss of function and gain of function mutant that I just told you. And uh, in this case, we crossed these mice uh, with the PDGF-B, which is expressed by the endothelial cells and is a particular uh, interesting promoter to be used uh, in brain microvasculature, which coded for CRE in this case, so these mice were... Uh, crossed, uh, and then is a, an inducible, uh, 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 it was a <laughs> tamoxifen inducible promoter, and so we were able to induce a loss of function and the gain of function of beta catene in different stages uh, after the birth of the animal. So we selected early stages when the barrier is still not completely organized, and later stages where the barrier was uh, fully organized. And I tried to summarize only in a few slides for not being too long these studies. And so this is, for instance, is the expression of Claudine 3 and PLVAP, which is, as I said, a marker of increased impermeability. This is the gain of function mutation. And what we asked here is uh, since we induce the recombination at early steps uh, after birth, so when the barrier is uh, not yet organized, we ask uh, whether if we induce uh, wind signaling, can we accelerate uh, the organization of the barrier? And as you can see here, there is... Uh, 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 in the presence of CRE, a clear increase in Claudine 3 and uh, a decrease in PLVAP, or better to say, uh, uh, the PLVAP was very high in normal condition and was decreased uh, when we induced uh, uh, wind signaling. Loss of function, this was uh, uh, the, the other way around. So in this case, uh, for instance, a longer time when the barrier is already organized, uh, we, uh, but, uh, you know, still there is some signaling of uh, wind. What we found here was that uh, if we induce a recombination, so in this case, loss of function of the signaling, what we observed was a decrease in uh, 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 clouding tree expression, and most interesting was an increase in PLVAP expression, which uh, was uh, confirmed also by an increase in the leakage of blue events. So apparently, wind seems to modulate uh, not only the vascularization of the brain, but also the, uh, uh, let's say, the, the uh, specialization of the cells uh, uh, to, to, to acquire the characteristic of the blood-brain barrier. Of course, now we are still working on this subject, uh, and we establish a sort of card uh, that uh, is a sort of identikit for the blood-brain barrier, because at the beginning we only use uh, specific markers, and of course in vivo we could not uh, uh, extend the study to many more. Uh, markers, but now we can really follow the uh, blood-brain barrier established at the different uh, step after birth. Uh, and I forgot to tell you, this can be also reproduced in vitro in culture cells uh, uh, from the brain. And in this case, what we did was to add the Win3A, but we 
could also reproduce the same data by infecting the cells uh, with the stabilized beta catenin and uh, through other approaches. However, the thing that I wanted to show you is that uh, you can reproduce the system also in vitro by, for instance, adding mint. You can see that there is an increase in cloud entry expression and also a reorganization of the tie junction and PLVAP is decreased. So all of this uh, now is uh, under development, and actually Roberta Paulinelli, that used to work with Mauro a lot of time ago, is uh, engaged in trying to develop an in vitro system uh, to see uh, whether we could uh, develop it for screening of drugs that can cross the barrier. So the idea is to substitute uh, the presence of the astrocyte, uh, so the co-culture, which is very difficult to do and you cannot use this for a large screening, with a control medium that contains wind or better, uh, Roberta developed a, a cell line that expresses a stabilized form of beta catenin and seems to retain all the broad brain barrier characteristic. And uh, we did it with the human brain, <laughs> microvascular to mice, uh, my, microvascular. So this is an immediate, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, side uh, uh, aspect of uh, this research. Okay, so having said all of this, if you are still patient, let me now uh, show something more about uh, the blood-brain barrier va vessels. And in particular, uh, the question is whether uh, there are pathologies that are linked uh, to alteration in the blood-brain barrier. And I already mentioned the uh, the, um, the, 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 ah, the <laughs> stroke or the other conditions. Of course, uh, there are other pathologies where are not the vessels that are sick, but are essentially the surrounding tissues. And in particular, for instance, if you take the tumors, and I know that you are particularly interested in vascular stabilization in the tumor, uh, this is an old paper by Peter Baluk and Donald McDonald showing how irregular is the vasculature in the tumor, and the junctions are dramatically altered. And this is just, again, a scanning microscopy that looks very much what uh, uh, Mazzone did. However, it's just to show you that the endothelial cells in the tumor are highly retracted, and frequently the tumor cells face directly the blood. And, uh, however, I wanted to show you also another type of pathology. So in the case of the tumor are the surrounding tissue that are affecting the normal morphology of the vessels. However, there might also be endothelial-specific pathologies where the vessels are abnormal. And uh, if we stay in the brain microcirculation, I, we have been focusing more recently on this particular pathology that is called cerebral cavernous malformation. And this pathology is characterized by this sort of malformation in the brain microvasculature that are called malberry. Because as you can see here, they form a sort of uh, uh, multiple lumen, and uh, uh, the vessels are in this region particularly fragile. So they break, and this uh, leads to hemorrhagic stroke, which uh, leads to more than 80% mortality. And indeed, uh, this pathology is uh, the major cause of uh, stroke uh, in the infancy, hemorrhagic stroke. These are the characteristics of this pathology, as you see, as you have seen before, malberry lesion. Uh, it is a, 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 a hereditary pathology, but it also may also be linked to sporadic mutation and uh, is autosomal dominant. Uh, the, essentially, uh, the pathology develops in heterozygous because the homozygous die during development, likely because the vascular system is not correctly uh, develop. One uh, thing that is particularly interesting is that the lesions are located in the brain, and there is quite a high prevalence in the population because you talk about 0.1.5% individuals, which means one out of 200, which is pretty high. Is really, I mean, uh, we always try to get support from Teleton for genetic disease, but we are always at the limit of the rare disease. <coughs> On the other side, as, uh, as I said, uh, is linked to mutation that are essentially null mutation, loss of function mutation, of three genes, uh, which are called the CCM, from cerebral cavernous malformation, one, two, and three. And uh, what is also striking is that uh, uh, the patient might have uh, a mutation on CCM1 or CCM2 or CCM3, and the phenotype is identical. So this uh, strongly suggests that these genes act together. They need uh, to be express all the three for the vessel to develop correctly. 
And uh, this is the, the last point. The, the gene has been characterized, and uh, the best uh, known is the CCM1, which also covers about 60% of, um, of the patients. And uh, from a structural point of view, very little is known. These are cytoplasmic protein. And little by little, I mean, now there is more and more interest on this pathology uh, because it's one of the first where is indeed endothelial cells to be, uh, <coughs> to be altered. And uh, the, most of our knowledge are related to CCM1. As you can see here, this is more or less some of the uh, uh, structural features and some of the partners uh, which have been found to be associated to CCM1. Most importantly, as you can see here, CCM1 can form a complex with CCM2 and CCM3. And this may be uh, important to understand why the null mutation of one or the others can indeed induce the same type of phenotype. Most interesting to us is that uh, this complex seems to associate to beta-catenin. And uh, so, of course, uh, this opens the possibility that the complex can also be linked to the junction or modulate beta-catenin signaling. And CCM1 can also bind to the small GTPase RAP1, which is important for junction stabilization. If you do the knockout of the three genes, you get that these are bad, not very nice features, but just to show you that if you do the knockout, uh, endothelia specific, uh, you get uh, a very early embryo lethality. And this is due to the fact that the vascular system is not correctly organized and likely explain why uh, the homozygous uh, do not, uh, do not uh, proceed in vascular development also in uh, human beings. Uh, what is uh, of interest is that the CCM genes are ubiquitous. But uh, indeed, uh, the only problem that were found uh, with the knockout uh, were, <coughs> were observed only when you inactivate the gene in endothelial cells. So this is uh, still unclear. But indeed, it seems that the predominant uh, cell type where these genes uh, can really modulate important function is, uh, uh, the, are the endothelial cells. And uh, for instance, the null mutation in the neural cell does not seem uh, to induce the same type of lesion. So the point was, uh, can we uh, uh, apply an inducible strategy in order to induce a knockout of these genes after birth? And this, of course, was crucial because uh, even if you can see in the embryo that uh, you know, there is a major vascular phenotype, still is not informative of the human disease. So it was important to try to reproduce in the mouse the same type of lesion that uh, were observed in the, in the humans. And there is another group that uh, work with the heterozygous, which is, however, quite uh, long work. They have to keep the mice heterozygous for longer time, even uh, by crossing them with uh, P53 three uh, null mice. And so this, uh, this is indeed a very long uh, type of uh, approach. So what we did instead was to induce an inducible mutation of uh, all the three genes. We have the three uh, mice uh, type, uh, the, these three mouse strains uh, that contain the flux CCM1 or CCM2 or CCM3 genes. And what we observed uh, in this case, uh, in this case we induced the mutation using uh, uh, the uh, uh, V-cadering promoter that is, as I said, an endothelial specific marker, so tamoxifen inducible to induce a recombination. And as you can see, these mice develop lesion which are mostly on the cerebellum, but they are also present in the, in the brain, which are pretty dramatic. And this was also easy to see in the retina vasculature. And uh, the retina vasculature is particularly interesting because it reproduces the same characteristic of the blood-brain barrier. As you can see, these mice uh, form a similar lesion. If you go more closer to their uh, uh, to the histological, uh, you can see this is a typical Mulberry lesion. You can distinguish the different uh, lumen. And also in the mutant mice, uh, you see different uh, lumen that are formed. And uh, then uh, this is the retina. As I showed you before, there are the lesions that are organized. They frequently hemorrhage. And what was of interest to us immediately was that uh, the lesions are essentially all venous. Type. So it seems that are the venous cells that they start to enlarge and to organize in this sort of multiple uh, lumen. They also, in our hands, uh, proliferate more. And uh, the, the after, you know, at the later stage of development of the lesion, there is a very uh, strong uh, macrophage infiltrate around uh, this uh, uh, type of lesion. 
So the point was, uh, shall we try to understand why the lack of one or the other CCM gene can indeed induce this type of malformation, and what can we do? And one of our questions, of course, we are sensitized by the fact uh, that uh, beta catenin is a member of the uh, endothelial junction, and this was our love since <laughs> several years. And so we immediately thought uh, maybe the altered lumen or the uh, fragility of this uh, lesion are due to the fact that the junction are not correctly organized. And uh, so we first ask whether the CCM through beta catenin could interact uh, with the adherent junction, so to be cadherin and uh, whether the abrogation of the CCM1 complex could affect the junction organization. So this was the hypothesis. So through beta catenin, they should link uh, to beta catenin, and uh, so the, the, there might be a series of effects due to the lack of this complex at the junction. So we did all series of co-immunoprecipitation analysis. I just show you one, but just to tell you that indeed we could co immunoprecipitate the CCM complex uh, with the adherent junction, and uh, also by immunofluorescence, we could see that uh, this is the distribution in cell culture of vicadirin and the cell-to-cell -cell contact, and this is, for instance, CCM1. But again, all what we did for one of these genes, CCM1, was absolutely the same with CCM2 and CCM3, so they also co-distribute uh, with uh, vicadirin. And what we found was that uh, if we abrogated the expression of vicadirin, in this case using uh, knockdown with Sirna, but we also used uh, vicadirin null endothelial cells and other tools, uh, we not only abrogated as expected the localization of vicadirin, but also the junctional organization of CCM1 was lost. So the question is, what happens if we uh, uh, abrogate the expression of CCM? And in this case, uh, for instance, we inactivated CCM by culturing the endothelial cells uh, from the mice uh, floxed uh, for the gene. And then we uh, induced the recombination in vitro by infecting the cells with adenocrine. So it's the same line uh, with or without CCM. And uh, as you can see here, without the CCM, there is a dramatic uh, uh, reorganization of the junction that are no more as a zipper type like a structure at the cell-to-cell -cell contact, but they are all confused and not correctly organized. And this is just a confocal of culture cells. As you can see, in normal condition, this is the staining of bicadirin beta catenin at the cell-to-cell -cell contact. And as you can see here, they really lose uh, uh, their normal organization. They go on the apical, lateral, basal uh, domain. And this is a 3D uh, collagen culture. Again, you see the cells are able to form a lumen in this condition, in three dimensional. And if you go here, I mean, uh, in absence of CCM, not only you lose a normal organization of the junction, but also the cells are unable to form only one lumen. They start to organize in more lumen, and they seem completely depolarized. And this was also true in the, in the lesion in the mouse. This is Vika Deering that is not correctly organized in comparison to normal cell-to-cell -cell concentration in normal vessels. And also, I mean, we always do like this, culture cells, the lesion in the mouse, and then the lesion in the humans, to be sure that what we observe is not just an artifact of culturing the cells and so on. And also in the human, you might appreciate the localization of bicadirin and the endothelial cell-to-cell -cell contact, and this was totally lost in the lesion. So junction are altered in absence of CCM, alteration of junction, and then um, I try to be shorter. <laughs> And uh, I know that you may be hungry, but uh, is, uh, so the idea is uh, without CCM, the junction are disorganized. Is this uh, the reason why the endothelial cell form uh, this uh, abnormal lesion? And indeed, uh, some indication was already present in the three-dimensional culture. <coughs> but the question is, uh, if the lumen is the problem, and if the junction are important for cell uh, polarization, as we assumed, then the absence of CCM uh, would be crucial for uh, uh, polarization and lumen formation. So we set up this assay, which allowed us to check for polarity of the endothelial cells. This is in normal condition, as I showed you. So culture cells, uh, 3D culture. And uh, we selected two markers. One is apical markers, that is podocalyxin, and the other one is collagen-4, it's a basal marker. And as you can see, in normal conditions, the cells are clearly polarized. Podocalyxin up, collagen-4 uh, on, uh, um, on the basal side. 
if you inactivate weak adhering, so you abrogate a normal organization of the adherent junction, cells lose polarity. And uh, uh, as you can see here, this is just a closer view. And they also start uh, to make a different lumen. What happens if we inactivate TCM1? As I showed you before, also in this case, uh, this is the control polarized cells uh, without CCM uh, as expected, because you might remember Vika Deering was totally disorganized. Also in this case, uh, cells lose polarity and they start to form a multiple lumen. And this was also true in the human lesion. I go a bit uh, fast. So we finally, uh, and I mean I try to only show a few of the slides, but of course we needed uh, to publish, uh, to give more molecular insight of this mechanism. So we said uh, CCM1 uh, and CCM in general are important for the normal organization of the junction. Junction are important for endothelial polarization and lumen formation. Why so? And so, uh, as you can see in this slide, there is an important complex which is well known that is called the PAR3, PAR6, PKC complex, which is crucial for cell polarization. In several different cell types, like for instance in the axon elongation, division, apical and basal polarity in epithelial cells. So we ask whether the complex can be localized at the junction, and I'm sorry for this dark slide, but you can see that, uh, again, in cultural condition, what we could see is that member of the complex, uh, thiamine is a, uh, uh, a GAF for, for RAC, that is also present in the polarity complex. You can see that the complex is indeed, uh, or different elements of this polarity complex are localized at the cell-to-cell -cell adhesion uh, junction. And uh, if you abrogate the weak adhering expression, you lose the localization of the polarity complex at the cell-to-cell -cell contact and also the activation of uh, APKC, which is the downstream of the polarity complex localization and activation was lost uh, in absence of Vicadiri. And then we went uh, to the lesion in humans to, to see whether <coughs> there was a correct localization of APKC in normal conditions, so in the normal vessels, you can distinguish some concentration of this APKC at the cell to cell contact and was completely lost uh, in the lesion. So in conclusion, what we believe so far is that uh, the presence of the complex is important, uh, likely bound to be adhering through beta-catenin by the, locali the correct localization of the polarity complex. And also, I didn't have the time to mention uh, the work on RAP1B. They likely stabilize the junction because RAP1B is known uh, to stabilize the cell-to-cell -cell contact. So localization of the polarity complex is crucial, not only for the apical basal uh, polarity, but also for a correct uh, lumen formation. So this is where we are now. And of course, uh, there are more data that we are trying to, uh, to collect to understand better this pathology. And of course, uh, to see whether we could define target uh, for therapy, because so far, this pathology doesn't have any therapy. And as I said, I mean, it's quite uh, frequent in the population, and therefore, it might be one of the major causes of uh, hemorrhagic stroke, for instance, in condition of hypertension or other situations. However, as you see, there are other uh, questions that remain uh, open uh, and, uh, to my view, are fascinating. For instance, why the abrogation of CCM affect only endothelial cells while these uh, genes are expressed also in other cell type, and while only the brain vasculature, and, uh, I mean, uh, they are expressed also in other type of endothelial cells. So it might be that in the brain you realize very quickly <laughs> whether you have a lesion or whether you get an hemorrhagic stroke. But it's also quite striking because the autopsy of this patient has been done quite, quite extensively <laughs> and apparently is essentially localized in the brain microvasculature. And of course, uh, uh, while uh, you only get uh, this lesion only in particular uh, region of the vessel and not uh, all over the vessels. And here the idea in the human beings uh, is that uh, you need a second heat in order to get homozygosity only in the, in the region. However, as you see in the mice, also in the mice, you have spotted lesion in the homozygous induced by recombination uh, after birth. So I think that all of this uh, needs to be clarified in the future. And there are other data that we collected, for instance, just to, since I discussed this morning with some of you, we also observed something that is really striking, and that is that the 
overall phenotype of these cells in the lesion, not outside the lesion, even if you induce recombination everywhere, but in the lesion is totally different. They undergo what is called the epithelial mesenchymal transition. They become elongated. The junction are really weak, as in mesenchymal cells. And so it seems to us that it is like a sort of the, one of the first examples of uh, uh, endothelial tumor. And uh, so uh, we are working on this. And of course, uh, being here and sharing with you uh, this, uh, this information are really very important to us. Thanks a lot for your attention.